You are listening to the Auditory Entertainment's production of Black Amazon of Mars by Leigh Brackett. Performed by Miranda Johnson and Ryan Johnson. Part 3 They waited. Some distance away, a guard leaned against the parapet, huddled in his cloak. He glanced at them incuriously. It was bitterly cold. The wind came whistling down through the gates of death, and below into the streets the watchfires shuddered and flared. They waited, and still there was nothing. Balin said impatiently, How can you know they're coming? Stark shivered, a shallow rippling of the flesh that had nothing to do with cold, and every muscle of his body came alive. Phobos plunged downward. The moonlight dimmed and changed, and the plain was very empty, very still. They will wait for darkness. They will have an hour or so between moonset and dawn. Thanis muttered, Dreams. Besides, I'm cold. She hesitated, and then crept in under Balin's cloak. Stark had gone away from her. She watched him sulkily, where he leaned upon the stone. He might have been part of it as dark and as unstirring. Demio sank low toward the west. Stark turned his head, drawn inevitably to look towards the cliffs above Kashat, soaring upward to blot out half the sky. Here, close under them, they seemed to tower outward in a curving mass, like the last wave of eternity rolling down, crested white with the ash of shattered worlds. I have stood beneath those cliffs before. I've felt them leaning down to crush me, and I've been afraid. He was still afraid. The mind that had poured his memories into that crystal lens had been dead a million years, but neither time nor death had dulled the terror that beset Ban Kruak in his journey through that nightmare pass. He looked into the black, narrow mouth of the gates of death, cleaving the scarp like a wound, and the primitive ape thing within him cringed and moaned, oppressed with a sudden sense of fate. He had come painfully across half a world to crouch before the gates of death. Some evil magic had let him see forbidden things, had linked his mind in a unholy bond with the long-dead mind of one who had been half a god. These evil miracles had not been for nothing. He would not be allowed to go unscathed. He drew himself up sharply then, and swore. He had left Nchaka behind, a naked boy running in a place of rocks and sun on Mercury. He had become Eric John Stark, a man, and civilized. He thrust the senseless premonition from him, and turned his back upon the mountains. Demios had touched the horizon. A last gleam of reddish light tinged the snow, and then was gone. Thanis, who was half asleep, said with sudden irritation, I do not believe in your barbarians. I'm going home. She thrust Balin aside, and went away, down the steps. The plain was now in utter darkness, under the faint, far northern stars. Stark settled himself against the parapet. There was a sort of timeless patience about him. Balin envied it. He would have liked to go with Thanis. He was cold and doubtful. But he stayed. Time passed. Endless minutes of it. Lengthening into what seemed hours. Stark said, Can you hear them? No. They come. His hearing, far keener than Balin's, picked up the little sounds, the vast and cohate rustling of an army on the move in stealth and darkness. Light-armored men, hunters, used to stalking wild beasts in the snow. They could move softly, very softly. I hear nothing, 
Balin said, and again they waited. The westering stars moved towards the horizon, and at length, in the east, a dim pallor crept across the sky. The plain was still shrouded in night, but now Stark could make out the high towers of the king city of Kashat, ghostly and indistinct. The ancient proud high towers of the rulers and their nobles, set above the crowded quarters of merchants and artisans and thieves. He wondered who would be king in Kushat by the time the unrisen sun had set. You were wrong, said Balin, peering. There's nothing on the plain. Stark said, Wait. Swiftly now, in the thin air of Mars, the dawn came with a rush and a leap, flooding the world with harsh light. It flashed in cruel brilliance from sword blades, from spearheads, from helmets and burnished mail, from the war harness of beasts, glistened on bare russet heads and coats of leather, set the banners of the clans burning, crimson and gold and green, bright against the snow. There was no sound, not a whisper in all the land. Somewhere, a hunting horn sent forth one deep cry to split the morning, then burst out the wild skirling of mountain pipes, the broken thunder of drums, and a wordless scream of exultation that rang back from the wall of Kashat like the very voice of battle. The men of Mech began to move, raggedly, slowly at first, then more swiftly as the press of warriors broke and flowed. The barbarians swept towards the city as water sweeps over a broken dam. Knots and clumps of men, tall men running like deer, leaping, shouting, swinging their great brands. Riders spurring their mounts until they fled belly down. Spears, axes, sword blades tossing. A sea of men and beasts rushing, trampling, shaking the ground with the thunder of their going. And ahead of them all came a solitary figure in black mail, riding a raking beast trapped in all black, and bearing a sable axe. Kushat came to life. There was a swarming and yelling in the streets, and soldiers began to pour up onto the wall. A thin company, Stark thought, and shook his head. Mobs of citizens choked the alleys, and every rooftop was full. A troop of nobles went by, brave in their bright mail, to take up their post in the square by the great gate. Balin said nothing, and Stark did not disturb his thoughts. From the look of him, they were dark indeed. Soldiers came and ordered them off the wall. They went back to their own roof, where they were joined by Thanis. She was in a high state of excitement, but unafraid. Let them attack, she said. Let them break their spears against the wall. They will crawl away again. Stark began to grow restless. Up in their high emplacements, the big ballistas creaked and thrummed. The muted song of the bows became a wailing hum. Men fell and were kicked off the ledges by their fellows. The blood howl of the clans rang unceasing in the frosty air, and Stark heard the rap of scaling ladders against stone. Thanis said abruptly, What is that? That sound like thunder. Rams, he answered. They're battering the gate. She listened, and Stark saw in her face the beginning of fear. It was a long fight. Stark watched it hungrily from the roof all that morning. The soldiers of Kushat did bravely and well, but they were as folded sheep against the tall killers of the mountains. By noon, the officers were beating the quarters for men to replace the slain. Stark and Balin went up again, onto the wall. The clans had suffered. Their dead lay in windrows under the wall, amid the broken ladders. But Stark knew his barbarians. They had sat restless and chafing in the valley for many days, and now the battle madness was on them 
and they were not going to be stopped. Wave after wave of them rolled up and was cast back and came again relentlessly. The intermittent thunder boomed still from the gates, where sweating giants swung their rams under the cover of their own bowmen. And everywhere, up and down through the forefront of the fighting, rode the man in black armor, and wild cheering followed him. Balin said heavily, It is the end of Kashat. A ladder banged against the stones a few feet away. Men swarmed up the rungs, fierce-eyed clansmen with laughter in their mouths. Stark was the first at the head. They had given him a spear. He spitted two men with it and lost it. A third man came leaping over the parapet. Stark received him into his open arms. Balin watched. He saw the warrior go crashing back, sweeping his fellows off the ladder. He saw Stark's face. He heard the sounds and smelled the blood and sweat of war, and he was sick to the marrow of his bones, and his hatred of the barbarians was a terrible thing. Stark caught up a dead man's blade, and within ten minutes his arm was as red as a butcher's and ever he watched the winged helm that went back and forth below, a standard to the clans. By mid-afternoon the barbarians had gained the wall in three places. They spread inward along the ledges, pouring up in a restless tide, and the defenders broke. The rout became a panic. It's all over now, Stark said. Find Thanis and hide her. Balin let fall his sword. Give me the talisman, he whispered, and Stark saw that he was weeping. Give it to me. I will go beyond the gates of death and arouse Ban Kroak from his sleep. And if he has forgotten Kashat, I will take his power into my own hands. I will fling wide the gates of death and loose destruction on the men of Mech. Or if the legends are all lies, then I will die. He was like a man crazed. Give me the talisman! Stark slapped him, carefully and without heat, across the face. Get your sister, Balin. Hide her, unless you would be the uncle to a red-headed brat. He went then, like a man who had been stunned. Screaming women with their children clogged the ways that led inward from the wall, and there was bloody work afoot on the rooftops and in the narrow alleys. The gate was holding, still. Stark forced his way toward the square. The booths of the hucksters were overthrown, the wine jars broken, and the red wine spilled. Beasts squealed and stamped, tired of their chafing harnesses, driven wild by the shouting and the smell of blood. The dead were heaped high where they had fallen from above. They were all soldiers here, clinging grimly to their last foothold. The deep song of the rams shook the very stones. The iron-sheathed timbers of the gate gave back an answering scream, and toward the end all other sounds grew hushed. The nobles came down slowly from the wall and mounted, and sat waiting. There were fewer of them now. Their bright armor was dented and stained, and their faces had a pallor on them. One last hammer stroke of the rams. With a bitter shriek, the weakened bolts tore out, and the gate was broken through. The nobles of Kashat made their first and final charge. As soldiers, they went up against the riders of Mech, and as soldiers, they held them until they died. Those that were left were borne back into the square, caught as in the crest of an avalanche, and first through the gates came the winged battle mask of the Lord Chiron, and the sable axe that drank men's lives where it hewed. There was a beast with no rider to claim it, tugging at its head rope. Stark swung onto the saddle pad and cut it free. Where the press was thickest, a welter of struggling brutes and men fighting knee to knee, there was the man in black armor, riding like a god, magnificent, born to war. Stark's eyes shone with a strange, cold light. 
he struck his heels hard into the scaly flanks. The beast plunged forward, in and over and through, making the long sword sing. The beast was strong and frightened beyond fear. It bit and trampled, and Stark cut a path for them, and presently he shouted above the din, Chiron! The black mask turned towards him, and the remembered voice spoke from behind the barred slot joyously. The wild man! Their two mounts shocked together. The axe came down in a whistling curve, and a red sword blade flashed to meet it. Swift, swift, a ringing clash of steel, and the blade was shattered, and the axe fallen to the ground. Stark pressed in. Chiron reached for his sword, but his hand was numbed by the force of that blow, and he was slow, a split second. The hilt of Stark's weapon, still clutched in his own numbed grip, fetched him a stunning blow on the helm, so that the metal rang like a flawed bell. The Lord Chiron reeled back, only for a moment, but long enough. Stark grasped the war mask and ripped it off, and got his hands around the naked throat. He did not break that neck as he had planned, and the clansmen who had started in to save their leader stopped and did not move. The throat he held was strong and supple, and his hands around it were buried in a mane of red hair that fell down over the shirt of mail. A red mouth, passionate with fury, wonderful curving bone under sculptured flesh, eyes fierce and proud, and tameless as the eyes of a young eagle, fire blue, defying him, hating him. By the gods, said Stark, very softly, by the eternal gods, a woman. And in that moment of amazement, she was quicker than he. There was nothing to warn him, no least flicker of expression. Her two fists came up together between his outstretched arms and caught him under the jaw with a force that nearly snapped his neck. He went over backwards, clean out of the saddle, and lay sprawled on the bloody stones. Half stunned, the wind knocked out of him. The woman wheeled her mount. Bending low, she took up the axe from where it had fallen, and faced her warriors, who were as dazed as Stark. I have led you well, she said. I have taken you to Kashat. Will any man dispute me? They knew the axe, if they did not know her. They looked from side to side, uneasily, completely at a loss, and Stark, still gasping on the ground, thought that he had never seen anything as proud and beautiful as she was then in her black mail, with her bright hair blowing and her glance like blue lightning. The nobles of Kashat chose that moment to charge. This strange unmasking of the Mekish lord had given them time to rally, and now they thought that the gods had wrought a miracle to help them. They found hope, where they had lost everything but courage. A winch, they cried. A strumpet of the camps. A woman. They howled it like an epithet, and tore into the barbarians. She, who had been the Lord Chiron, drove the spurs in deep, so that the beast leaped forward screaming. She went, and did not look to see if any had followed in among the men of Kashat. And the great axe rose and fell, and rose again. She killed three, and left two others bleeding on the stones, and not once did she look back. The clansmen found their tongues. Chiron! Chiron! The crashing shout drowned out the sound of battle. As one man, they turned and followed her. Stark, scrambling for his life underfoot, could not forbear smiling. Their childlike minds could see only two alternatives to slay her out of hand, or to worship her. They had chosen to worship. He thought the bards would be singing of the Lord Chiron of Mech as long as there were men to listen. 
He managed to take cover behind a wrecked booth, and presently make his way out of the square. They had forgotten him, for the moment. He did not wish to wait until they or she remembered. She. He still did not quite believe it. He touched the bruise under his jaw where she had struck him, and thought of the lithe, swift strength of her, and the way she had ridden alone into battle. He remembered the death of Thord, and how she had kept her red wolves tamed, and he was filled with wonder, and a deep excitement. He remembered what she had said to him once. We are of one blood, though we be strangers. He laughed, silently, and his eyes were very bright. The tide of war had rolled on towards the king's city, where, from the sound of it, there was hot fighting around the castle. Eddies of the main struggle swept, shrieking through the streets, but the rat runs under the wall were clear. Everyone had stampeded inward, the victims with the victors close on their heels. The short northern day was almost gone. He found a hiding place that offered reasonable safety, and settled himself to wait. Night came, but he did not move. From the sounds that reached him, the sacking of Kashat was in full swing. They were looting the richer streets first. The upraised voices were thick with wine and mingled with the cries of women. The reflection of many fires tinged the sky. By midnight, the sounds began to slacken, and by the second hour after, the city slept, drugged with wine and blood and the weariness of battle. Stark went silently out into the streets, towards the king's city. According to the immemorial pattern of Martian city-states, the castles of the king and the noble families were clustered together in solitary grandeur. Many of the towers were fallen now, the great halls open to the sky. Time had crushed the grandeur that had been Kashat more fatally than the boots of any conqueror. In the house of the king, the flamboys guttered low, and the chieftains of Mech slept with their weary pipers among the benches of the banquet hall. In the niches of the tall carved portal, the guards nodded over their spears. They, too, had fought that day. Even so, Stark did not go near them. Shivering slightly in the bitter wind, he followed the bulk of the massive walls until he found a postern door, half open as some kitchen knave had left it in his flight. Stark entered, moving like a shadow. The passageway was empty, dimly lighted by a single torch. A stairway branched off from it, and he climbed that, picking his way by guess and his memories of similar castles he had seen in the past. He emerged into a narrow hall, obviously for the use of servants. A tapestry closed the inn, stirring in the chill draft that blew along the floor. He peered around it and saw a massive vaulted corridor. The stone walls paneled in wood, much split and blackened by time, but still showing forth the wonderful carvings of beasts and men, larger than life and overlaid with gold and bright enamel. From the corridor, a single doorway opened, and Otar slipped before it, curled on a pallet like a dog. Stark went back down the narrow hall. He was sure that there must be a back entrance to the king's chambers, and he found the little door he was looking for. From there on was darkness. He felt his way, stepping with infinite caution, and presently there was a faint gleam of light filtering around the edges of another curtain of heavy tapestry. He crept towards it and heard a man's slow breathing on the other side. He drew the curtain back a careful inch. The man was sprawled on a bench athwart the door. He slept the honest sleep of exhaustion, his sword in his hands, the stains of his day's work still upon him. He was alone in the small room. A door in the farther wall was closed. Stark hit him and caught the sword before it fell. The man grunted once and became utterly relaxed. Stark bound him with his own harness and shoved a gag in his mouth and went on through the door in the opposite wall. 
The room beyond was large and high and full of shadows. A fire burned low on the hearth, and the uncertain light showed dimly the hangings and the rich stuffs that carpeted the floor and the dark, sparse shapes of furniture. Stark made out the latticework of a covered bed, let into the wall after the northern fashion. She was there, sleeping, her red hair the color of flames. He stood for a moment, watching her, and then, as though she sensed his presence, she stirred and opened her eyes. She did not cry out. He had known that she would not. There was no fear in her. She said with a kind of wry humor, I will have a word with my guards about this. She flung aside the covering and rose. She was almost as tall as he, dark-skinned and very straight. He noted the long thighs, the narrow loins, and the magnificent shoulders, the small virginal breasts. She moved as a man moves, without ornament. A long, furred gown that Stark guessed had lately graced the shoulders of the king lay over a chair. She put it on. Well, wild man? I have come to warn you. He hesitated over her name, and she said, My mother named me Kyra, if that seems better to you. She gave him her falcon's glance. I could have slain you in the square, but now I think you did me a service. The truth would have come out sometimes. Better then, when they had no time to think about it. She laughed. <laughs> they will follow me now over the edge of the world if I ask them. Stark said slowly, Even beyond the gates of death? Certainly there. Above all else, there. She turned to one of the tall windows and looked out at the cliffs and the high notch of the pass, touched with greenish silver by the little moons. Ban Karak was a great king. He came out of nowhere to rule the Norlands with a rod of iron, and men speak of him still as half a god. Where did he get his power, if not from beyond the gates of death? Why did he go back there at the end of his days, if not to hide away his secret? Why did he build Kashat to guard the pass forever, if not to hoard that power out of reach of all the other nations of Mars? Yes. Stark, my men will follow me, and if they do not, I will go alone. You are not Ban Kruak, nor am I. He took her by the shoulders. Listen, Kyra, you are already king in the Norlands, and have a legend as you stand. Be content. Content? Her face was close to his, and he saw the blaze of it the intensity of ambition, and an iron pride. Are you content? she asked him. Have you ever been content? He smiled. For strangers, we do know each other well. No, but the spurs are not so deep in me. The wind and the fire. One spends its strength in wandering, the other devours. But one can help the other. I made you an offer once, and you said you would not bargain unless you can look into my eyes. Look now. He did, and his hands upon her shoulders trembled. No, he said harshly. You're a fool, Kyra. Would you be as Otar, mad with what you have seen? Otar is an old man and likely crazed before he crossed the mountains. Besides, I am not Otar. Stark said somberly, Even the bravest may break. Ban Kruak himself. She must have seen the shadow of that horror in his eyes, for he felt her body tense. What of Ban Kruak? What do you know, Stark? Tell me! He was silent and she went from him angrily. 
You have the talisman, she said. That I am sure of. And if need be, I will flay you alive to get it. She faced him across the room. But whether I get it or not, I will go through the gates of death. I must wait now, until after the thaw. The warm wind will blow soon, and the gorges will be running full. But afterward, I will go, and no talk of fears and demons will stop me. She began to pace the room with long strides, and the full skirts of the gown made a subtle whispering about her. You do not know, she said in a low and bitter voice. I was a girl child without a name. By the time I could walk, I was a servant in the house of my grandfather. The two things that kept me living were pride and hate. I left my scrubbing of floors to practice arms with the young boys. I was beaten for it every day. But every day I went. I knew even then that only force would free me. And my father was a king's son, a good man of his hands. His blood was strong in me, and I learned. She held her head very high. She had earned the right to hold it so. She finished quietly. I have come a long way, and I will not turn back now. Kyra. Stark came and stood before her. I am talking to you as a fighting man, an equal. There may be power behind the gates of death. I do not know. But this I have seen. Madness, horror, and evil that is beyond our understanding. I think you will not accuse me of cowardice. And yet I would not go into that pass for all the power of all the kings of Mars. Once started, he could not stop. The full force of that dark vision of the talisman swept over him again in memory. He came closer to her, driven by the need to make her understand. Yes, I have the talisman, and I have had a taste of its purpose. I think Ban Kruak left it as a warning, so that none would follow him. I have seen the temples and the palaces glitter in the ice. I have seen the gates of death. Not with my own eyes, Kyra but with his, with the eyes and the memories of Ban Kruak. He had caught her again, his hands strong on her arms. Will you believe me, or must you see for yourself the dreadful things that walk those buried streets, the shapes that rise from nowhere in the mists of the past? Her gaze burned into his. Her breath was hot and sweet upon his lips, and she was like a sword between his hands. Shining and unafraid. Give me the talisman. Let me see. He answered furiously. You're mad. You're as mad as Otar. And he kissed her in a rage, in a panic lest all that beauty be destroyed. A kiss as brutal as a blow that left him shaken. She backed away slowly, one step and he thought she would have killed him. He said heavily, If you will see, you will. The thing is here. He opened the boss and laid the crystal in her outstretched hand. He did not meet her eyes. Sit down. Hold the flat side against your brow. She sat in a great chair of carven wood. Stark noticed that her hand was unsteady her face grave. He was glad she did not have the axe where she could reach it. She did not play at anger. For a long moment she studied the intricate lens, the incredible depository of a man's mind. Then she raised it slowly to her forehead. He saw her grow rigid in the chair. How long he watched beside her, he never knew. Seconds, an eternity. He saw her eyes turn blank and strange, and a shadow came into her face, changing it subtly, altering the lines, so that it seemed almost a stranger 
was peering through her flesh. All at once, in a voice that was not her own, she cried out terribly. The talisman dropped, rolling to the floor, and Kyra fell forward into Stark's arms. He thought at first that she was dead. He carried her to the bed in an agony of fear that surprised him with its violence, and laid her down, and put his hand over her heart. It was beating strongly. Relief that was almost a sickness swept over him. He turned, searching vaguely for wine, and saw the talisman. He picked it up and put it back inside the boss. A jeweled flagon stood on a table across the room. He took it and started back. And then abruptly, there was a wild clamor in the hall outside, and Otar was shouting Kyra's name, pounding on the door. It was not barred. In another moment, they would burst through, and he knew they would not stop to inquire what he was doing there. He dropped the flagon and went out swiftly, the way he had come. The guard was still unconscious. In the narrow hall beyond, Stark hesitated. A woman's voice was rising high above the tumult in the main corridor, and he thought he recognized it. He went to the tapestry curtain and looked for the second time around its edge. The lofty space was full of men, newly wakened from their heavy sleep, and as nervous as so many bears. Thanis struggled in the grip of two of them. Her scarlet kirtle was torn, her hair flying in wild elf locks, and her face was the face of a mad thing. The whole story of the doom of Kushat was written large upon it. She screamed again and again, and would not be silenced. Tell her! Tell the witch that leads you! Tell her that she's already doomed to death with all her army! Otar opened up the door of Kyra's room. Thanis surged forward. She must have fled through all that castle before she was caught, and Stark's heart ached for her. You! She shrieked through the doorway, and poured out all the filth of the quarter upon Kyra's name. Balin has gone to bring doom upon you. He will open wide the gates of death, and then you will die. Die! Die! Stark felt the shock of a terrible dread as he let the curtain fall. Mad with hatred against the conquerors, Balin had fulfilled his raging promise and had gone to fling open the gates of death. Remembering his nightmare vision of the shining evil ones whom Ban Kruach had long ago prisoned beyond those gates, Stark felt a sickness grow within him as he went down the stair and out of the postern door. It was almost dawn. He looked up at the brooding cliffs, and it seemed to him that the wind in the pass had a sound of laughter that mocked his growing dread. He knew what he must do, if an ancient mysterious horror was not to be released upon Kashat. I may still catch Balin before he's gone too far. If I don't... He dared not think of that. He began to walk very swiftly through the night streets toward the distant, towering gates of death. This concludes Part 3 of Black Amazon of Mars by Leigh Brackett Part 4 coming soon Performed by Miranda Johnson and Ryan Johnson If you enjoyed this performance, please subscribe, leave a comment, or a review. Thank you for listening.